Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest lecture. And this is going to be a multi-part series of lectures on small bowel tumors. And although the small bowel accounts for over 90% of the surface of the alimentary tract, tumors of the small bowel represent less than 5% of all GI tract tumors. So one of the challenges then, whether you're doing CT or MR or fluoro, is that we often don't think about small bowel tumors because they're uncommon. And depending on your protocol with CT, it's very easy to miss things, whether you're using positive contrast or neutral contrast or the push these days, no contrast. It can be a real challenge to make the diagnosis, particularly when the tumors are small, and obviously small is when we want to detect them. In this article by Williams, they made the point, differentiating normal bowel from abnormal tumor depends on imaging modality and the particular technique. While endoscopic evaluation is more sensitive for detection of intraluminal tumors that can be reached, CT as well as MR and NUC studies remain the key study, particularly when there's extraluminal components or when the tumor is extraluminal. For example, think about a carcinoid tumor. But also, as we'll discuss in this series of talks, things like capsule endoscopy, which at one point were 100% sensitive and 100% specific, really are not as good as that. And there are all sorts of challenges. And these days, CT is the study of choice. And when things fail, fail or there's a question, then you may see endoscopic uh, evaluation. So let's talk about protocols. The two things you need to think about are oral contrast and intravenous contrast. Oral contrast, if I'm doing a dedicated small bowel study, I do tend to like water as a contrast agent. 1,000 cc's over a 30-minute period works well. There's no doubt if you use positive contrast, there are some potential advantages. People have made the point, Perry Pickard, for example, I'll show you a reference, that sometimes things like metastasis are very easy to miss when they go to small bowel if you're not giving positive contrast. So there's some discussion, but the one thing no one disagrees about is you need to distend the bowel. And whether you're using oral water or you're using positive contrast like oral omnipake or you're using even volumen, you need to do something. And of course, IV contrast is critical. 100 to 120 cc's injected at 4 to 5 cc's a second becomes very, very important. Again, some tumors are vascular. Some tumors will hide, but because they're vascular, think just for a second, think carcinoid. It makes it easier to detect. Also, in terms of differential diagnosis, if I see a mass, its enhancement pattern will often allow me to be very specific. Again, whether it's an adeno or lymphoma, which is homogeneous but doesn't enhance, carcinoids, very vascular, and gists, which also can be very vascular, particularly when they're small. Now, there really is no role for non-contrast scans. We don't do it. And delayed phase imaging after arterial and venous really is not necessary as well. We need thin sections, 0.75 millimeters every 0.5. You want sub-millimeter thickness because when you do the reconstructions, which are critical both in 2D and 3D, this will give you the best reconstructions. And once you have 64 slice scanners, there's no reason you can't do these protocols. We look at axial views, but again, with all of CT, we will always tell you multiplanar is part of the routine study. And more and more 3D imaging becomes important, whether it's volume rendering or cinematic rendering, which is a form of volume rendering, or MIP. If you want to pick up small lesions, you're going to have to do more than just look at the axial images. And here's a case where a duodenal mass was missed. And I can ask you, do you see the duodenal mass? Now, I've chosen the best images that barely show it. And you're looking at a 1.3 centimeter lesion, second portion of the duodenum. You can see the image on your right. I have a cursor measuring it. And now I'm circling it. And when you see it with a circle, it's very obvious because it's enhancing. It's a little over a centimeter, but it's vascular. It's a carcinoid tumor, but it's easy to see. But the fact is, if you would have done the coronal views or the volume rendered views, look how much more obvious the lesion is. Look how much easier it is to see because it's a very flat lesion. Flat lesions can easily be missed on axial views because it may not be the right view, but the volume view really shows it nicely. It makes it very easy to recognize. 
great example of why you should be able to pick up one centimeter lesions. Or in this case, positive contrast was used. This was read as negative. Obviously, what happened, and I look back, it was an outside scan. Remember, everything missed is an outside scan. The people assumed that this was unopacified bowel loops. They never did multiplanar. If you did the multiplanar, you would see it's obviously a mass. That's the malignancy. Very easy to see on these images right there. Again, you can make assumptions that are wrong on axial images only. You got to go with the multiplanar. Now, the patient came to Hopkins about six months later. We used uh, water and IV contrast. You can see the lesion here. It's enhancing. You see it better on the MIP imaging. You see it better on the coronal. And again, the enhancement, the feeding branch vessel off the SMA to the lesion. And again, how you use the 3D mapping to accentuate. MIP is very good at picking up small vascular lesions. In this case, it would have been potentially easy on this uh, without positive contrast, again, to miss the lesion. But you see how obvious it is when you do the study correctly. Now, in terms of numbers, small bowel adenocarcinoma is a real, rare malignancy. We spoke about that. Age is 55 to 64. That 60s is where most tumors are. Five-year survival is 65%. And of course, the key is early detection. If you look at the numbers, the SEER data, small bowel cancer is number 23 on the list. Uh, this is going back a couple of years, but its position is still the same today. You see the mean age at about 65 years. When you think about small bowel tumors, there are four big categories. Adenocarcinoma, carcinoid tumors, lymphoma, and sarcomas. It's interesting that small bowel tumors are increasing, particularly carcinoids, which is a fourfold increase. There's also a fifth group we'll speak about, which are metastasis, which are becoming more common, particularly in an era where people are living longer from other malignancies. Depending on the article you read, adenocarcinoma or carcinoids are the most common tumor. Let's speak about each of the tumors individually. Let's look at some examples and let's see what we can learn. Well, adenocarcinomas, the earliest appearance might be diffuse infiltration of a segment of bowel. Now, when it's subtle infiltration, it can easily be missed. You might see polypoid masses. You can see a constricting lesion. And of course, that causes obstruction, which makes it easier to see. And sometimes you see a large ulcerating lesion, which can be exophytic as well. Adenocarcinoma is more common proximally, so it's most common in the duodenum. Remember, lymphoma is more common distally. Its clinical presentation is variable. It's associated with certain conditions like Crohn's disease and sprue and celiac disease. It's also more frequent in patients with familial adenomatous polyposis, or FAP. There's a lot of concern about small bowel neoplasms being related to diet. Eating high-fat foods may raise the risk of small bowel cancer. In terms of presentation, that's one of the challenges. Pain, nausea, vomiting, weight loss, obstruction, potentially GI bleeding, or just some vague abdominal pain and maybe weight loss, so it can be somewhat challenging. People always make the point from initial presentation to diagnosis with small bowel tumors, it's often six to 18 months because it's not very specific. Think about your own CT practice. How often do you get a requisition that says, rule out small bowel tumor? It's not very frequent. Now, one of the things we notice is small bowel tumors are often missed at initial presentation. If you look at this patient who has a tumor, and I'm telling you there's a tumor in the third and fourth portion of the duodenum, but when you look at the axial views, are you really impressed? Is that simply just the duodenum normal? Here it is again, but now look at it a coronal view. On the coronal view, you really see the infiltration from the second portion of the duodenum to the fourth portion. A good example of where a, the stension of the duodenum with water is critical, but B, when it's infiltrating like that, on the axials, it may not be very impressive, but on the coronal, it is indeed very impressive. Or this example, look at the duodenum third and fourth portion. It's easy to walk past that, but as you look more carefully, you recognize on the axial, there's thickening, 
on the coronal, this thickening and lobulation, that's a patient with adenocarcinoma. You can see as we look at a few more coronals and we look at the volume rendering in coronal plane, the lesion becomes much more obvious. So you can see in this case, there's no bile obstruction, there's no stricture, there's no adenopathy. If you pick the lesion up at this point, the patient will get the resection and should do well. Another example, abdominal pain and weight loss. Here it's a bit easier because the third portion of the duodenum is distended and you then see a transition point. You then look at the coronal plane and you see the transition in the third portion of duodenum. There's infiltration in the third and fourth portion of the duodenum, so it's easy to make a diagnosis of tumor. The problem, of course, in this case is you've made the diagnosis and the patient has liver mets, so the outcome is going to be poor. This patient had two prior scans where the lesion in the duodenum was missed because there was an obstruction and the lesion was smaller, kind of looking back at the prior cases as an example. So again, infiltration, obstruction, that's easy to make the call, but it may be a little bit too late. Another example here, you look at the axial images, you're kind of ready to walk by the case. You look at the coronal and you say, what's going on around the fourth portion of duodenum? You see how it's infiltrated and it's thickened? You get a few more images, you get the coronal and you get the 3D volume rendering. You really see what looks like infiltration of the duodenum, there's a transition point. And that's a duodenal carcinoma. It's not very bulky, it's not causing obstruction, but the lumen is narrowed. Now, can you make a mistake? Well, of course, if bowel is not distended, you can undercall or overcall. But at least in this case, if you weren't certain, you would either repeat the CT, or more importantly, you probably would go directly to endoscopy. But just a beautiful example of what's a very subtle lesion. Now, we are using cinematic. Here you can see there's the lumen, there's the infiltration. So cinematic rendering may be a good way to pick up small bowel tumors. Here it is again from a view from below showing you the transition. Remember, fluid tends to be red. There's the infiltration of the adenum, very nicely shown in that example. And here it is, just a few more images. So again, we are trying to figure out ways of accentuating the presence of pathology. Things like texture mapping with cinematic rendering may be one of the things that will become very helpful in the future. Another example, here's a mass where you say, okay, now I see it. Is this duodenum? Is it pancreas? Is it ampullary? Good question on those axillary, axil, axial images, but again, you see something. Now you look a little bit further and now you recognize there's infiltration obstructing the patient's common duct. Common duct obstruction, we usually think about pancreatic cancer. We can think about ampullary cancer. Ampullary tumors can grow into a duodenum, but duodenal tumors can also grow into the ampulla, which was the case in this example. So sometimes you're going to pick up the pathology. They'll have to biopsy it, obviously, but you're not always going to be right as to the specific diagnosis. And here it is with cinematic rendering, which really shows you the lesion very nicely. Another example, here you see a duodenal tumor in the fourth portion of the duodenum going into the jejunum. There's no obstruction at this point, but just see the infiltration. Again, the importance of good distension. Here it is on the coronal views and on the volume rendering. You do see what appears now to be a little bit of distension of the third and fourth portion of duodenum transitioning right at the patient's tumor and the volume rendering particularly shows the infiltration nicely. So I do like 3D imaging in these cases. A volume display can often be very helpful. Here's a few more images showing that infiltration by the adenocarcinoma. Here's the same patient again with cinematic rendering. The red is the fluid in the bowel. You look at the transition point of where fluid stops. That's the patient's small bowel tumor, very nicely shown. And here's just a few more images. So again, we are trying hard to figure out the ways of making sure people don't miss small bowel tumors and detect them when they can be treated for cure. So it becomes very important. Now, sometimes tumors grow large and can simulate other tumors. So for example, this was sent to pancreatic conference as a pancreatic adenocarcinoma, and it kind of does in many ways look like it, but when you look at the epicenter, it's really the duodenum. There's a large ulcer present. The pancreas looked okay. There was dilated common duct, which always makes you think about pancreatic adenocarcinoma. 
But this was a large ulcerating adenocarcinoma of the duodenum, which obstructed the common duct. Now, at the end of the day, they're going to get a biopsy anyway, so they'll know the right answer. Treatment of a case like this is a Whipple's procedure, which is the same as for pancreatic adenocarcinoma. But again, you want to be able to suggest the diagnosis, the correct diagnosis in advance, but sometimes it can be very tricky. So let's look at a second tumor then. So we've covered adenocarcinoma. Let's now move into carcinoid tumors. But I'll tell you what we'll do. Before we do carcinoid, let's just take a short break and we'll come back and start off with carcinoid tumors. Be right back. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.